Organized crime is a competitive field. And just like in any other competitive environment, there are occasionally groups and characters that just stand out, even among their countless competitors. The American Mafia alone has had multiple bosses who fell into this category. Lucky Luciano, John Gotti, and Al Capone being only a few examples. In Colombia, you have Pablo Escobar, maybe the most famous of them all. Japan's Yakuza gangs lacked such a standout character or group. Sure, the history of organized crime in Japan goes back more than 400 years, but rarely was there ever a group or person that represented the nation's crime as a whole. It wasn't until after the Second World War that one particular Yakuza gang rose to the top and stood head and shoulders above the rest. While the names Yamaguchigumi and Taokakazuo are certainly not household names beyond the Japanese border, there are many reasons as for why this should be the case. From clinging on to membership numbers in the low double digits to becoming the biggest crime organization in Japan, this video will cover it all over the course of 7 chapters. In chapter 1, we will take a look at how the Yamaguchigumi was established. In chapter 2, Taoka Kazuo becomes the gang's leader and transforms it into a force to be reckoned with in chapter 3. A classic East vs West rivalry turns violent in chapter 4, before Taoka leaves behind some big shoes to fill in chapter 5. In chapter 6, things really get out of hand, thanks to the bloodiest gang war in Japanese history. Finally, in chapter 7, we will take a look at the evolution of the Yamaguchigami and the Yakuza from the 1990s until today. This is the story of the Yamaguchigami. The founding of Japan's biggest ever gang takes us to the early 20th century and the Russo-Japanese War, which ended in September of 1905. A 24-year-old soldier by the name of Yamaguchi Harukichi was finally allowed to go back to his home country of Japan, the port city of Kobe, to be exact. When he started work as a fisherman upon his return, he quickly discovered that the job simply wasn't for him and got a job as a dock worker instead. The docks were, of course, a big focal point of business in the city of Kobe, and still are to this day. It didn't take much time for Harukichi to rise through the ranks at his new job at the port of Kobe. He possessed the physical strength necessary for a dock worker, but also showcased some incredible leadership and organizational skills. While gaining recognition at his workplace, Harukichi also joined the Oshimagumi in 1912. The Oshimagumi was one of the biggest Yakuza groups in Kobe at the time, and was also involved in business at the docks, supplying the local shipyards with laborers as well as bodyguards. Just like at work, he also made quite an impression on the members of the Oshimagumi. In 1915, just three years after joining, he took around 50 of the gang's members and founded his own gang as their leader. The gang was to bear his family name, and was named Yamaguchigumi, or Yamaguchi Association. This might also be a good time to explain their cool looking logo. The name Yamaguchi is written with the letters for Yama, meaning mountain, and Kuchi, which means entrance. The Yamaguchi emblem takes the letter for mountain and warps it into the shape of a diamond. This is also the reason why the gang's logo is often referred to as Yamabishi, or mountain diamond. Pretty cool. From the very beginning, Harukichi and his followers got into the same business that they were involved in at their previous gang, by supplying laborers to shipyards. Interestingly, Yamaguchigami members also knew how to entertain the masses. They were known in Kobe to be quite talented performers of Rokyuku, a type of narrative singing which was popular in early 20th century Japan. It didn't take very long for the Yamaguchigami to gain many new members, and eventually even outgrow the group that it split from the Oshimagumi. Despite the manpower and popularity that he attained, Harukichi decided to hand over the reins of the Yamaguchigumi only 10 years after its creation. As a successor, he chose his eldest son, Noboru, who was only 23 years old at the time. 
Despite his young age, he had already made a name for himself as a talented, up-and-coming gang boss, taking control of his own group before succeeding his father as the head of the Yamaguchi Gumi. Noboru was able to further expand the family's poor business, as well as their presence in Kobe's entertainment industry. Apparently, he even had a hand in the sport of sumo wrestling. Despite his talents and achievements as boss of the Yamaguchi Gumi, the gang's future rise to the top would come from an unexpected place. His younger brother's high school class. Taoka Kazuo was born in 1913 in a prefecture called Tokushima, which is located on Shikoku, the smallest of Japan's four main islands. A rough early life awaited him as soon as he was born, with his father passing away immediately. When he was six years old, he lost his mother as well, due to a heart attack caused by overwork. As a result, young Kazuo ended up in the care of his uncle and his aunt, who resided in Kobe. While his uncle was abusive and a heavy drinker, his aunt simply didn't care about her nephew at all. When he was only 14, he was sent to work on the docks of Kobe, all while still attending high school. It was at school that he became friends with Yamaguchi Hideo, the younger brother of Yamaguchi Gumi leader Noboru. Thanks to these connections to the gang, both through his classmate and his work at the docks, Taoka started associating with the Yamaguchi Gumi. For multiple years though, he was nothing more than an errant boy, having to slowly work his way up the hard way through the ranks of the Yakuza group. On his way to becoming an actual sworn member of the gang, he earned the nickname The Bear earned through his incredibly violent nature during fights. It was said that Taoka enjoyed the act of gouging out his opponent's eyes a bit more than an average person would. After running errands and gouging eyes out for 9 years, he finally became a true member of the Yamaguchi Gumi. However, following this achievement, he immediately received an 8 year prison sentence for fatally attacking the member of a rival gang. While his prison sentence was supposed to end in 1945, he was released early in 1943. The relief that Taoka must have felt when he was finally released from prison was hugely overshadowed by what happened outside of his jail cell during the previous five years though. The founder of the Yamaguchi Gumi, as well as his son and leader of the gang, both died while Taoka was locked up. Of course, Japan was deeply involved in World War II as well, which saw the national budget poured into combat while the population was starving. No exception was made for the Yakuza. Their previous sources of income like street markets, gambling and extortion were now a thing of the past, while the political influence and connections that they were able to acquire were of no use anymore. Additionally, their members would be drafted into the military in large numbers, destroying many of the biggest pre-war gangs in the country. The end of the war was followed by a difficult period of rebuilding under American occupation. In the early days of this occupation, pretty much the entire police force was dismantled, leading to turmoil and disorder across Japan. To replace the police, Taoka formed his own group, the Taokagumi, which was supposed to replace the police and keep disorder in Kobe at a minimum, while also bringing the growing black markets under their control. Quickly, the Taokagumi made a name for itself in its hometown, which also caught the attention of the Yamaguchi Gumi elders, who were still looking for a successor to Noboru. In October of 1946, Taoka earned the title of Kumicho of the Yamaguchi Gumi, making him the boss of an organization which was nearly decimated during the war. Just like the government of Japan, he had a tough rebuild ahead of him. A rebuild that he would not only successfully pull off, but one that was about to surpass any and all expectations. When Taoka took over the Yamaguchi Gumi, the former glory of the gang had almost completely vanished. Taoka though turned out to be a mastermind in terms of organization as well as making do with what he had available to him. What he had were around 25 members, about half of what the gang started with back in 1915. 
Thankfully for Talca, these 25 members were the most dedicated bunch that one could hope for. This passion was mixed in with the leader's ruthlessness, which he knew how to balance with a sharp mind and sense for business. The Yamaguchi Gumi was now ready to rise to the top. One of his first moves was setting up a construction business which employed the gang's members, with many of Japan's biggest cities, including Kobe, left almost completely destroyed after the war. Finding jobs in construction was anything but difficult. On top of that, Taoka's men could get work done extremely efficiently. Even among the Japanese, these loyal Yakuza members stood out as a particularly hardworking bunch. While construction certainly secured a steady flow of cash for the Yamaguchi Gumi, Taoka was already looking at additional sources of income, gambling and extortion to be exact. To get into these profitable but competitive businesses, Taoka was even ready to cooperate with another gang called Hondakai. The Hondakai was the leading group of Bakuto or gamblers in post-war Kobe and should have been a valuable ally for the Yamaguchi Gumi. While Taoka tried to keep up good relations with the Hondakai, he was simply too ambitious to consider another gang boss as his equal. Consequently, a gang war ensued, which saw Taoka's Yamaguchi Gumi handily outclass the Hondakai in terms of sheer violence. Taoka's men might have learned a thing or two from the bear, as their leader was called in the past. One has to wonder how many eyes were poked out during this gang war. Ultimately, the Hondakai was not only defeated, it was also absorbed by the Yamaguchi Gumi. But Taoka didn't stop there. His next targets came from Osaka, Japan's second biggest city and close neighbor of the city of Kobe. The Meiokai, a Korean gang, as well as the Miyamoto Kai, were both defeated and allowed Taoka to step foot into Osaka for the first time. Osaka is well known for being home to some of Japan's most extroverted and fun people. Naturally, it didn't take long for show business to become a big thing again in Osaka, only a few years after World War II. Taoka saw the potential money in this rise of the entertainment industry and created a talent agency. This agency was actually able to get involved with some of Japan's most high-profile entertainers of the 1950s. Among them were singer Misora Hibari, the singing comedian Enomoto Kenichi, and the musician Tabata Yoshio. Even with all this glitz and glamour becoming a part of his life, he didn't forget about his roots as a dock worker, further expanding his business at the Kobe docks. The city had one of the country's and one of the world's busiest ports. By the mid-1960s, Taoka was able to control a whopping 80% of all the cargo that was handled at Kobe's shipyards. He owned around 14 companies in Kobe, which made him around $17 million in 1965 alone. Taoka also tried his best to get his gang members to educate themselves about business. He was quoted as telling them that from now on, Yakuza must read economic newspapers and to pay attention to the stock markets. Speaking about his gang, the Yamaguchi Gumi, their expansion happened at a rapid pace as well. By 1964, 343 smaller Yakuza families were part of the Yamaguchi Gumi, totaling around 10,000 Kobun, or lower class gangsters, under the control of Taoka Kazuo. At this point, there was no denying it. Taoka had made it. Not only as a gang boss who commanded enough men to start a small army, he had also proven to be a savvy businessman who can compete with the best of them. Such financial power and influence unavoidably caught the attention of Japanese government officials as well. Kono Ichiro, at the time Minister of Transportation and future Deputy Prime Minister, gave Taoka's companies political backing. Meanwhile, Taoka also became friends with the Tiger of Tokyo, Tanaka Segen, who was a businessman himself and gave Taoka additional financial backing. Obviously, Taoka and the Yamaguchi Gumi did not only make friends as they became more powerful. Soon, resistance from Japan's capital would come their way. The Kansai region in the west of Japan, which contains Osaka, Kyoto, and Kobe, historically always had a bit of a rivalry with the eastern region of Kanto, where Tokyo and its surrounding areas are located. This rivalry is usually a light-hearted one, like you'll find it in many other countries as well. Joking about the other region's attitude, dialect, food, or sports team has been a common theme between the east and west of Japan. 
but with the Yakuza, this rivalry would take on a form that was quite a bit more serious and dangerous. In 1963, political mastermind and Yakuza collaborator Kodama Yoshio envisioned an alliance of gangs all across Asia, an ambitious plan that didn't quite work out the way that Kodama would have liked. Very quickly, he realized that involving gangs from the whole continent of Asia would be too much to handle, even for the most powerful man in Japan. He then settled for an all-Japan alliance, which he held talks over with Taoka Kazuo. Obviously, an all-Japan gang alliance needed the country's biggest gang on its side. However, Taoka declined the offer. Maybe he saw nothing to gain from it, or maybe he remembered his failed alliance with the Hondakai a few decades earlier. As a response, Kodama would bring together the most powerful Yakuza gangs of Tokyo and Yokohama. The Kantokai was born. Up until this point, the Kanto region, while certainly being an incredibly busy area when it comes to organized crime, did not have a single Yakuza gang that could come even close to rivaling the Kansai region's Yamaguchigumi. Clans who joined the Kantokai included, among a few others, the Inagawakai, the biggest gang in all of Tokyo at the time, the up-and-coming Sumiyoshi Kai, as well as the Tose Kai, led by their Korean boss Machi Hisayuki. Naturally, gangs in Tokyo and Yokohama who thought about the future of their territory were afraid of Taoka and his men moving into their turf, with numbers far beyond what the Kanto gangs could offer by themselves. An alliance made sense for the Yakuza clans of Eastern Japan. With their combined numbers of over 13,000 men, they could easily keep Taoka out of the Kanto region. Or so they thought. Taoka, as a show of power, or maybe for his own amusement, kept on sending a few of his men into Yokohama, which occasionally resulted in armed battles, like the so-called Grand Palace incident. Kodama, the founder of the Kantokai, was actually not interested in these Yakuza clan wars at all. His goal now was to calm down Taoka, which he tried to achieve by setting up an alliance between the Yamaguchigumi and the Toseikai. Believe it or not, but Kodama actually got the stubborn Taoka to agree to this alliance with the Tokyo-based gang. From then on, it was agreed that no more than 10 Yamaguchigumi members were allowed at a time in Yokohama. But we are talking about Taoka Kazuo here, of course. Which means that he very quickly found a way around this agreement. Remember Tanaka Segen, the Tiger of Tokyo? With his help, Taoka devised a plan to invade Yokohama once again, which involved the creation of the League for the Stomping Out of Drug Traffic. This group, which contained countless Yamaguchigumi gang members, was supposed to publicly fight a war on drugs on the streets of both the Kansai and Kanto regions. This included, of course, the city of Yokohama. Taoka even released a public statement regarding the rampant drug use among his own gang members. It was simply agonizing to see them when they were out of drugs. Their wives had an awful time and tried to have their husbands recuperate by imprisoning them in the house, but half of them died and half of them became invalids. In addition to telling this truly heart-wrenching story to the media, he also got the Kansai Housewives Association to join his cause by protesting on the streets along with his men. Despite Taoka's best efforts to make the whole thing as believable as possible, Everyone knew what was really going on, including the police and the general public. Despite that, there wasn't much that Kodama and the Kantokai could do at this point. As a result, tensions between the Kansai and Kanto gangs peaked when a member of the Tosei Kai shot and almost fatally wounded Tanaka Segen, the mastermind behind the drug protests. The assailant's motivation was, of course, revenge for his boss, Machi Hisayuki who probably suffered the most from having the Yamaguchigumi in his territory. Despite the assassination attempt, Tanaka survived and left the hospital only four months later. Machi actually apologized for his underling's behavior by bringing Tanaka 2 million yen in cash, while chopping off his fingertip and giving it to Taoka Kazuo. For those of you who are unfamiliar with the practice of Yubitsume, Cutting off your fingertip and handing it to another gangster is pretty much the highest form of apologizing among Yakuza. You only do this when you really, really mess something up. Tensions with the Inagawa Kai, the biggest Kanto gang of them all, also remained high. But only until their boss was sent to jail for three years because he ran an illegal casino. Taoka had to take advantage of this somehow, obviously. 
He told his men in prison that they should make the Inagawa bosses stay as pleasant as they possibly can. In turn, the Inagawa boss would be in Taoka's debt. When Inagawa left prison in 1969, his crew was almost completely decimated, with around three quarters of his men arrested, while the remaining quarter was incredibly disorganized. Maybe because he was in Taoka's debt, or maybe because he simply realized that fighting was now especially pointless, he decided to form an alliance with the Yamaguchi Gumi. In 1972, with Kodama Yoshio as a mediator, the alliance between Japan's most influential Yakuza clans at the time became a reality. It was celebrated with the centuries-old Yakuza tradition of sharing sake cups as an initiation ritual. Sake was poured into unglazed ceremonial cups and drunk. The two then wrapped the cups in special paper and put them into their kimono. They then clasped each other's hands. The go-between held their clasped hands and announced, the sake cup ritual on even terms is now over. With the Yamaguchi Gumi and the Inagawa Kai joining forces, there were now only four prefectures in all of Japan that were completely free of this alliance. For a while, things were looking good for the Yamaguchi Gumi but they would soon face one of the more complicated periods in their history. July 1978. Location, Berami Nightclub in Kyoto, Japan's historic capital. A man dressed in a white shirt rises from his seat and walks towards a table near the club stage, where Taoka Kazuo and five bodyguards are seated. He pulls out a 38 caliber pistol and shoots the Yamaguchi Gumi boss in the neck. Taoka is rushed to the hospital, escorted by police. The assassin was Narumi Kiyoshi, member of the Matsuda Gumi, a rival gang from the Kansai region. A few years earlier, Narumi's boss passed away while fighting a gang war against the Yamaguchi Gumi. Narumi's motive was, as is too often the case, revenge. However, his seemingly invincible target survived the attack. The assassin himself was found dead a few weeks later in the mountains near Kobe. As a result, a gang war ensued, which took the lives of at least five more Matsuda Gumi members. While Taoka weathered another storm, there was no doubt that his reign at the top was nearing its end. While his mind was still as sharp as ever, his body was slowly failing him, even before the assassination attempt. Inside the Yamaguchi Gumi, questions about Taoka's succession were raised, especially with the existence of a big age gap inside the gang. With almost no middle-aged members around, it was hard to find someone to mentor the youngest members, which resulted in certain values and traditions losing their significance in the minds of the Yamaguchi Gumi youth. One of the biggest unwritten rules among Yakuza is that gang wars are never to be fought in public. These battles increasingly took place out on the open streets though, endangering the Japanese citizens who grew tired of their safety being at risk more often than ever before. The police shared the same opinion as the public and decided to act. For 80 days, the police fought a war against the Yakuza by mobilizing a total of 1,100 police officers who arrested 2,000 gang members, among them 518 high-ranking ones. No exceptions were made for the mighty Yamaguchi Gumi. The gang's second highest ranking member, Yamamoto Kenichi, was arrested and jailed for three and a half years. Taoka tried to remedy the situation by making peace with rival gangs and even calling for an official Yamaguchi Gumi press conference to be held. The situation did calm down, but it wasn't long before the violence returned. Probably due to health reasons, Taoka decided to stay under the radar, while his gang unsuccessfully attempted to expand its territory into Japan's northernmost island, Hokkaido. Nonetheless, the Yamaguchi Gumi held onto its power without much trouble as they entered the 1980s. In July of 1981, Taoka suffered one final heart attack before passing away at the age of 68. Over the span of 38 years, he saved the Yamaguchi Gumi from near extinction and turned them into the biggest and most feared organization in Japan. He was also the first Yakuza boss who understood how to profit from Japan's post-war economic miracle. When he passed away, the Yamaguchi Gumi was making around $460 million per year. Not only that, the gang's presence could be felt everywhere. 
construction, street stalls, gambling, bars, clubs, cabarets, everywhere you went in Japan during the early 1980s, the Yamaguchigami was probably somehow involved with it. The gang's foray into narcotics dealing, started in the late 70s, set up a gigantic source of revenue that is still essential to its existence to this day. The Yamaguchigumi was, at least in Japan, a household name by the time that Taoka Kazuo met his demise. Who knows what organized crime in Japan would look like these days if it wasn't for his influence. At first, only a private funeral was planned for the Yamaguchigumi boss, with the police warning the clan against organizing a big public ceremony. The higher-ups of the group and his family did not listen. Only three months later, 1300 Yakuza members from 200 different gangs arrived in Kobe to mourn the death of their boss. However, not only members of Japan's underworld were present, but also a few Japanese superstars. One of these famous attendees, singer Tabata Yoshio, said, From the late 1950s to the late 70s, what entertainer in Japan was not helped by Taoka? Another example was famous actor Takakura Ken, who even portrayed Taoka Kazuo in a Yakuza movie at one point. After the funeral, the elephant in the room had to be addressed. Who will follow in Taoka's footsteps? Taoka's right-hand man, Yamamoto, was supposed to be a successor, but he was in jail at the time and died from liver cirrhosis shortly after his release. This led to a very surprising choice. Until an actual successor was found, Taoka's wife, Humiko, would take over as a sort of interim gang boss. The biggest gang in the country was now under the control of a woman. Fumiko was a smart leader and well respected by many influential members, but due to the field of organized crime being primarily dominated by stubborn men, she had a hard time in leading the Yamaguchigumi. These difficulties in finding a successor, in combination with other problems that the Yamaguchigumi was already facing for years, led the police to arrest many of the gang's leaders, while rival gangs took the opportunity and attempted to fight back their territory. Despite all of these internal changes and problems that the gang had to face, the Yamaguchigumi managed to actually grow in numbers instead of dropping down the food chain. Between Taoka's death in 1981 and 1983, their membership numbers would climb to a staggering 13,300 members. This army of gangsters wanted a true successor to Taoka, one that would be elected by the syndicate's 104 family bosses. A group of eight elite members was chosen to assist Fumiko in leading the Yamaguchigumi until the decision was made. Out of these eight members, two ended up in the final stretch to becoming the new Kumicho, the new boss of the Yamaguchigumi. Candidate number one was Yamato Hiroshi, a relative of Kazuo's right-hand man, who I mentioned earlier. Yamamoto had been a member of the gang for decades and was a very loyal and respected person inside the organization. The second candidate was Takenaka Masahisa, a longtime friend of the late Taoka Kazuo and his family. He was known to be a very aggressive and yet popular figure among members, and was also Humiko's personal favorite to win the election. When the election came to an end, Takenaka came out on top quite handily, which was something that his opponent Yamamoto could simply not accept. Losing the election frustrated Yamamoto so much that he decided to leave the Yamaguchigumi to create his own gang under the name Ichiwakai. Not only did the Yamaguchigumi now have a new rival to worry about, the Ichiwakai also took around half of its members with it and instantly created one of the top three biggest gangs in Japan. Once again, the Yamaguchigumi was faced with a complex problem that needed a solution. Thankfully, Takenaka their new boss came up with a great idea. All departed members would be pardoned, should they regret their decision and decide to go back to the Yamaguchigumi. In addition, retirement payments were also introduced for every member, something that senior Yakuza members could usually only dream of. Takenaka's plan seemingly worked as intended, with droves of ex-Yamaguchigumi members returning to their former clan. The Ichiwakai shrunk to a size of around 2,800 men. Still a massive gang, 
but one that paled in comparison to the one that it decided to split away from. Yamamoto, the Ichiwakai leader, had to take action. He could not stand the thought of being defeated by Takenaka yet again. On January 26, 1985, four black cars pulled up in front of an apartment complex in Osaka's Suita city. In front of the building's elevator stood Takenaka, along with two of his highest-ranking affiliated gang bosses. The men exited their cars and fired at Takenaka and his associates. One of them died immediately, while the other was brought to the hospital and also passed away a few hours later. Takenaka as well was rushed to the hospital, where Yamaguchi Gumi members were also present and offered blood donations. However, even after a 9-hour long surgery, Takenaka succumbed to his wounds and passed away. With one fell swoop, the top men of the Yamaguchi Gumi were taken out, and the deadliest gang war in Japanese history, the Yamaichi War, had begun. The furious Yamaguchi Gumi soon elected a temporary leader, Nakanishi Kazuo, who wasted no time in declaring war on the Ichiwakai. In the span of one year, a total of 200 armed attacks were recorded to have taken place between the two gangs. The Yamaguchi Gumi that same year got involved in a gigantic arms stealing scandal, which would be reported even by American news outlets while becoming one of the biggest stories of the year in Japan. The gang was caught red-handed in Hawaii, where they attempted to buy a crazy amount of weapons, including rocket launchers, from what they thought were arms dealers, but were actually American undercover agents. The investigation saw the Yamaguchi Gumi with two of their highest ranking members sent to prison in the US, while also costing them a ton of money and, of course, respect. Surprisingly, even though a videotape of the deal being agreed was shown in court, the Yamaguchi bosses were found not guilty. The jury suspected entrapment, but the Yakuza also told the court that there had been a big cultural misunderstanding of the Japanese language, and that they had only been in Hawaii to hire Michael Jackson for a gig. No, I did not make that last part up. Despite all of the turmoil going on inside of the Yamaguchi Gumi, the Ichiwakai was slowly but surely losing the war in Osaka. The violence, though, seemed to never find an end, until one incident disgusted even the ruthless Yamaguchi Gumi. One of their ex-members, who joined the Ichiwakai, was found brutally killed near a cliff, which was also known as Banzai Cliff. Here, in 1944, hundreds of civilians and soldiers, including women and children, jumped from the cliff and to their deaths, in order to avoid being captured by American soldiers. The Yamaguchi Gumi had enough and called for peace between them and the Ichiwakai. The war was over, but for the 38 people who lost their lives during the Yamaichi War, it was unfortunately too late. The Yamaguchi Gumi remained as strong as ever, while the Ichiwakai shrunk into something that merely resembled a small gang by 1989. That same year, after four years of temporary leadership by Nakanishi, the Yamaguchi Gumi elected their true fifth generation boss. Watanabe Yoshinori. With a new leader at the top, their membership grew to 20,000 as they headed into the 90s. For decades, there was a sort of unwritten agreement between the Yakuza and the Japanese government and law enforcement. The Yakuza were basically allowed to operate their businesses and have their gang wars among each other, as long as the public is not involved in any of it. However, the 1980s were a turning point regarding this agreement, with the recent gang wars being brought into the public more than ever before and violence reaching a noticeable peak. In 1991, Japan finally addressed the Yakuza problem with the so-called Crime Countermeasures Act. With this new law, Yakuza gangs could now officially be designated as Boryokudan, or violent groups, if certain criteria were met. Boryokudan are subjected to certain legal measures and penalties, which are aimed mostly at illegal activities like the collection of protection fees as well as extortion, two very important sources of income for the Yakuza groups. Additionally, it was now illegal to charge money or request a severing of a finger in order to let a member leave the gang, which is supposed to make quitting life as a criminal easier for those who decided to do so. 
these laws were certainly a step in the right direction. For the first time in Japanese history, the Yakuza, who've been around for centuries at this point, were officially recognized as something negative and problematic to society. Still, these new laws brought with them countless critics, who felt that the penalties were much too weak. For example, the Yakuza's finances could still not be targeted directly, and their assets were still pretty much untouchable as well. Despite all of these flaws, both the media and the police were quick to claim a victory over the organized crime groups of Japan. There were countless headlines and reports made about droves of Yakuza members quitting and gangs disbanding. In reality, the impact of the new laws was not as significant as it seemed. Front companies were set up by the gangs, which then simply employed defected members, making their activities much harder to track than before. In 1994, the total number of Yakuza members was at around 80,000. About half of these members were estimated to be employed at these front companies, and actually committed more crimes than those who were officially part of the clan. As for the many gangs which were reported to have disbanded, almost all of them were small, insignificant crime families. This also had the side effect of strengthening the bigger crime groups, the top three being the Yamaguchi-gumi, the Inagawa-kai, and the Sumiyoshi-kai. Before the new laws came into effect, they accounted for approximately 45% of all gang membership in the country. Now, that number had jumped to an incredible 65%. The big gangs were well prepared, even before the new laws were implemented. The Yamaguchi-gumi, for example, handed out a handbook titled How to Evade the Law and sent out faxes to affiliated gangs telling them to prepare by setting up front companies. By the time that the new millennium was around the corner, the number of Yakuza members did actually not go down. More power was simply shifted to those who had already been at the top for years or even decades. By the year 2000, the Yamaguchi-gumi had reached a membership of around 34,000, and managed to stay afloat mainly thanks to its thriving construction business. While trying to save its struggling economy throughout the 1990s, Japan invested an astonishing $3.5 trillion into public works projects. An estimated 1-5% of that money went into Yakuza-related construction businesses. The Yamaguchi-gumi, hugely involved in construction, surely raked in billions of these deals. In 2005, Watanabe, who acted as the boss of the Yamaguchi-gumi for 16 years, decided to retire and pass the torch to Tsukasa Shinobu, who became the Yamaguchi-gumi's sixth and most recent boss. Compared to some of his predecessors, Tsukasa is known to keep a fairly low profile or as low of a profile as you can keep as the boss of what is, still, Japan's biggest crime syndicate. The total number of Yakuza is currently at around 24,000, 8,000 of which belong to the Yamaguchi-gumi. Just recently, in 2015, a group of senior members inside the Yamaguchi-gumi had a serious dispute with their boss, questioning both his leadership and the overall organizational structure of the gang. Consequently, they took around 1,000 Yamaguchi-gumi members and formed a new clan under the name Kobe Yamaguchi-gumi. As of the making of this video, their disputes remain unresolved. The police, however, are keeping a close eye on the two rival gangs, in hopes of avoiding violent outbreaks like the ones the Japanese citizens had to deal with too many times in the past. The story of the Yamaguchi-gumi has it all. During their more than 100-year-long history, they watched their country transform in many ways, politically and culturally. The same could be said about the Yamaguchi-gumi itself. Under six generations of leadership, they witnessed a meteoric rise to the top. Near extinction, a comeback story that turned them into Japan's most dominant criminals, dangerous rivalries, internal rebellions and lots of drama. Due to their secretive nature, it's hard to gauge how much influence the Yakuza actually still have these days. With a sharp decline in membership, one can only wonder what the future holds not only for the Yamaguchi-gumi, but for organized crime in Japan in general. What did you think about the Yamaguchi-gumi's long but turbulent history? Let me know in the comments. Also, if you enjoyed this video, make sure to like and subscribe if you haven't already. Either way, thank you so much for watching. Sayonara.